Okay, so picture this. It's 1968 Mexico City. Mm -hmm. The eyes of the world are on them. They're gearing up to host the Summer Olympics. Exciting time. Right. Like a moment of national pride, they're calling it the Mexican miracle. The economy's booming. Everything seems, you know, fantastic on the surface. On the surface, yeah. But, like every good story, there's more to it than meets the eye. What if I told you this, this miracle? It was hiding a really dark secret. Yeah, I mean, beneath all the pomp and circumstance of the Olympics, there was a much more uh, complex reality. Like you said, economically, things were... Well, they were booming for some, but for many Mexicans, they were struggling with intense inequality. Really stark contrast, I imagine. Well, absolutely. A mm -hmm. very small percentage of the population held a huge amount of the wealth. And to make matters worse, all of this was happening under the rule of the PRI. The Institutional Revolutionary Party, right. Exactly. And they were, shall we say, not known for their tolerance of opposing viewpoints. Let's just say they weren't handing out any awards for freedom of speech. So you've got all this tension simmering beneath the surface. And then you've got the students. But this wasn't just a few kids complaining about homework. This was a full-blown movement. Oh, yeah, they were fired up. And it makes sense. You know, think about what was happening globally at the time. Oh, for sure. Huge social changes happening all over. Right. Civil rights movement in the U.S., the protests against the Vietnam War, all of that energy, that fight for equality and justice, it resonated with these students. They saw the inequalities in their own country, in their own backyard, and they knew they couldn't stay silent. So they're looking at what's happening around the world and then looking at their own government. And they're thinking, hey, we deserve a say in how our country is run, too. They were demanding real democracy, real change, not just empty promises. And they weren't afraid to make some noise to get their point across. They organized protests. They demanded the release of political prisoners. They were really pushing the boundaries. They were. And, you know, this was a huge problem for the government, for Diaz or Daz. They were completely obsessed with projecting this image of a modern, thriving Mexico to the world because of the Olympics. They were going to extreme lengths, even removing street vendors and homeless people from the city center just to create this this fake sense of order and prosperity. Wow. So it's all about appearances for them, huh? But you can't just sweep real problems under the rug like that. Exactly. And these students were, well, they were making sure those problems didn't stay hidden. So how did the government respond to this growing student movement? It seems like something had to give. Well, let's just say um, listening to dissenting voices wasn't exactly their uh, top priority. Yeah. I can imagine that didn't go over well with the PRI. They were all about control, weren't they? Exactly. They saw these protests as a direct attack on their on their whole Olympic charade, you know? Like, hey, these yeah. students were going to ruin their big moment. And they were willing to do whatever it took to keep that from happening, right? Oh, absolutely. Which brings us to October 2nd, 1968, a day that would forever be seared into Mexico's memory. The Plaza de las Tres Colchos. A plaza full of history, now forever linked to this tragedy. Right. It's where the past and present quite literally collide, architecturally speaking. But on that day, it became the stage for something horrifying. You can almost feel it, can't you? This sense of dread, knowing what's about to happen. So, set the scene for us. What was supposed to happen that day? So you have thousands of people gathering in the plaza. Students, professors, families, ordinary people, really. All drawn together by this idea of of creating a more just Mexico. They believed that their voices, that their presence there, could actually make a difference. It's tragic, almost heartbreaking, because we know it's coming, but they didn't, did they? No, they had no idea. And that's what makes it even more more gut-wrenching. Because the government had been planning this. They strategically positioned troops, snipers, even brought in this this paramilitary group, the Battalion Olympia. Wait, the Battalion Olympia, they were the ones dressed in plain clothes, right? Blending into the crowd. Yes, it was a setup from the very beginning, a calculated attack on their own citizens. It's just, it's sickening. Absolutely. And then at 6.10 p.m., as the sun was starting to set, the plaza just erupts in gunfire. Witnesses described it as absolute chaos. Gunfire screams, mm. people running for their lives. Can you imagine the terror? It's unimaginable. Just just picture it. You're there, you're with your friends, your family, maybe you're a student full of hope, full of idealism, and then suddenly there's gunfire. Mm. People are dropping all around you. There's nowhere to go. Just a sea of people all caught in this 
horrifying moment. Exactly. Unarmed civilians trapped completely at the mercy of a government that was clearly terrified of its own people. And even with all the evidence, all the eyewitness accounts, the government still tried to downplay what happened. Oh, absolutely. The official death toll they released, a paltry 29 individuals. Less 29. But independent estimates, those tell a much different story. They range from 300 to 400 or even more. That's a huge discrepancy. It is. And it speaks volumes about the lengths to which the government was willing to go to control the narrative, to erase what really happened that day. To think that even in the face of such a tragedy, the instinct was to lie, to cover up, to silence the truth. It's something we unfortunately see even today, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Governments, organizations, they still try to manipulate information to control what we believe. It's chilling. It really is. To think how, how easily they thought they could just rewrite history. Mm -hmm. But like the truth always has a way of, it does. of coming out, doesn't it? Even after, like you said, it does. decades. Yeah. So, so what happened in the days and weeks that followed? How did the government try to like spin this? Well, they went into damage control mode big time. They they immediately tried to control the narrative, you see. They painted the students as the aggressors. Oh, so they flipped the script, blamed the victims. Exactly. They were they were calling them communists, radicals, a threat to national security, anything to discredit them. They even went as far as to manipulate the media coverage. Wow. So they really tried to like erase the narrative, control the information. Oh, absolutely. They wanted to make sure that their version of events, no matter how fabricated, was the one that stuck. It's just, it's a classic tactic, isn't it? <laughs> but it's, it's scary how effective it can be. It is. And, and it's something we see even today, right? Misinformation, propaganda. It's a constant battle to discern the truth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in this case, thankfully, the truth did eventually start to emerge, even with the government's attempts to bury it. How did that happen? Who started to kind of uncover what really happened at Tlatelolco? Well, it was a slow and painstaking process, that's for sure. But it was a testament to the courage and determination of a lot of people. Survivors, witnesses, journalists, historians, they refused to let the government's lies stand. Declassified documents started to surface. Eyewitness accounts were shared, often at great personal risk. Forensic evidence was re-examined. And slowly, piece by piece, a more accurate picture of that day began to emerge. It's amazing how powerful those individual stories can be. Like one voice can be silenced, but when they all start coming together, it's it's much harder to ignore. Absolutely. And in the case of Tuatoloco, those voices found an even larger platform through art, through literature, through film. I mean, have you seen the movie Rojo Amanecer? By Don in English, right? Yeah. It's it's a really powerful film. It tells the story of the massacre through the eyes of a family living in Tuatoloco. You see the events unfold from their perspective, from inside their apartment, and it really brings the horror of that day into sharp focus. It's one thing to hear about these events, to read about them in a history book, but to see it depicted so vividly, so personally, it just it adds a whole other layer of, of understanding and empathy. It does, and, and that's the power of heart, right? To, to help us connect with these historical events on a human level, to make them real for us, to ensure that we never forget. And Rojo Amaneser wasn't the only work of art that emerged from this tragedy. There was the Lina Poniatowska's book, La Noche de Tlatelolco, a collection of testimonies from people who were actually there that day. Right, right, exactly. It's such a, it's such a powerful reminder that you know, history isn't just dates and names in a textbook. It's about real people, real lives, real stories. Exactly. And those stories, they deserve to be heard. They need to be remembered. And it seems like the people of Mexico, they haven't forgotten. I mean, even today, they still say, Gudi Octubre, no se olvida, October 2nd is not forgotten. It's more than just a remembrance, though, isn't it? Oh, absolutely not. It's become a call to action, a reminder that the fight for justice, for truth, for accountability... It doesn't end. It's something that requires constant vigilance, constant effort. It's so easy to look at something like this, something that happened over 50 years ago, and think, well, that was then, this is now. But the reality is these same patterns, these same abuses of power, they're still happening all over the world. They are. And that's why it's so important to remember Tulatuloco, not just as a tragedy, but as a reminder that we can never take our freedoms for granted. We have to be willing to speak out against injustice, to hold our leaders accountable, to fight for what's right. So as we as we wrap up this this deep dive into Latoloco, the events, the aftermath, the ongoing fight for truth and justice, what's what's the biggest takeaway? What do you want our listeners to walk away with today? The importance of remembering. Because when we forget our history, when we allow those in power to rewrite the narrative, 
we become complicit in those injustices. We owe it to the victims of Klotloko and to ourselves to never forget what happened there and to do everything in our power to ensure that such atrocities never happen again. Powerful words. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. It's been a somber but incredibly important conversation. Thanks for having me.